Gases were the last set of substances to be understood chemically, and until about 1750 the only gas known was air. Unlike solids and liquids, gases will expand to fill any space available. Most of them are colorless and many are odorless. All gases have a very low density and can be mixed in any proportion to form solutions. Volume, pressure, and temperature are interrelated for a particular quantity of a gas. This means that changing one of these three properties will affect at least one of the other two, given the quantity of gas is kept constant. Additionally, the state in which we observe any substance is dependent on the temperature and pressure. Pressure is the exertion of a force by one body on another. You may have heard it defined as force per unit area. Atmospheric pressure is the force exerted on your body and everything else by the air in the atmosphere. There are two devices that are commonly used to measure pressure exerted by gases. The barometer is used to measure atmospheric pressure. Consisting of a long glass tube sealed at one end and filled with a liquid, it was designed in the early 1600s by Italian scientist Evangelista Torricelli. The tube is inverted and sits in a dish of the same liquid. This causes some of the liquid to flow out of the tube and into the dish, creating a vacuum at the sealed end of the tube. Because of the force exerted by the air on the surface of the liquid, not all of the liquid flows out, as the column of liquid is supported. The pressure exerted by the atmosphere can be read from the height or distance between the surfaces of the liquid in the dish and tube. This distance will depend on the altitude of the barometer and on the liquid used, which is usually mercury. The height of a mercury column at sea level, where the elevation is 0 meters, is 760 millimeters. This is defined as standard atmospheric pressure. A manometer is used to measure the pressure exerted by a gas in a closed container. The same principles are involved as for a barometer. A manometer consists of a U-tube filled partially with mercury. One side is connected to the gas container while the other one is open to a region of known pressure, most often the atmosphere. The gas in the container exerts a force that tends to push the mercury down, and the atmospheric pressure also exerts a force on the mercury. The difference between the heights of the two mercury levels is a direct measure of the difference between the two gas pressures. This pressure difference is often referred to as delta H. Let's look at an example to better illustrate how to make measurements using these devices. Here we want to determine the pressure of an enclosed gas sample, which requires the use of a manometer shown on the right. This manometer is open to the atmosphere, but we aren't directly given the atmospheric pressure. However, we can determine the atmospheric pressure using the barometer shown on the left. Since the height of the mercury column is 765 millimeters, we can say that the atmospheric pressure is 765 millimeters mercury. Next, we see that the height difference between the two mercury levels is 112 millimeters mercury. To get the pressure of the enclosed sample, we either add this difference to the atmospheric pressure or subtract it from the atmospheric pressure. So which is it? Since we can see that the column of mercury has been pushed closer to the enclosed gas sample, the pressure exerted by the atmosphere should be larger than the pressure exerted by the enclosed sample. In other words, the pressure of the enclosed gas should be less than that of the atmosphere. That would mean we subtract the height difference from the atmospheric pressure to give us the pressure of the enclosed gas sample. As there are several other units that can be used to measure pressure, we should quickly review how we'd convert between them. In this example, we need to convert the pressure of a full scuba tank from 204 bar to being in terms of PSI. The equivalencies between various units of pressure are shown below. We already defined 760 millimeters mercury as being the standard atmospheric pressure, which leads to the particularly useful unit of atmospheres. Additionally, because millimeters mercury is awkward to write, this unit is often called a tor in honor of Torricelli. Recall that pressure is force per unit area, so the unit of pounds per square inch, shortened to PSI, makes perfect sense. The SI unit of pressure is the Pascal, named after the French physicist and mathematician Blaise Pascal. It is defined as one newton per square meter, but because it's so small, it's often expressed in kilopascals. This leaves the unit of the bar, which is very close to standard atmospheric pressure. Now to convert from bar to PSI, we can simply use the conversion factor of 14.7 PSI per 1.01 bar. Based on the three sig figs of the initial value and the conversion factor, our final answer is to three sig figs, and there are a couple of ways we could write this. We will now take a look at a number of mathematical relationships between pressure, volume, temperature, and the amount of substance present, known as gas laws. Robert Boyle, who is known for writing The Skeptical Chemist, in which he refuted Aristotle's idea that all matter was composed of earth, air, fire, and water, and is largely regarded today as the first modern chemist, studied the effect of altering the pressure on the volume of air. 
He found that the pressure and volume of a gas sample are inversely related. For instance, if the volume is halved, the pressure is doubled due to an increase in the frequency with which the gas particles strike the walls of the container. It was fortunate that the temperature remained constant during his experiments, as a variation in temperature would have impacted his results. Boyle plotted his volume data against pressure and obtained a graph like this one. When volume was plotted against the inverse of the pressure, a straight line resulted. The result of this experiment was Boyle's law, which states that at a constant temperature, the volume occupied by a fixed quantity of a gas is inversely proportional to its pressure. Mathematically speaking, we can write this as the volume is directly proportional to the inverse of pressure. For instance, writing an equation for the straight line graph in y equals mx plus b form, and observing that the y-intercept, b, was zero, yields this if we move pressure to the left side. Essentially, the product of pressure and volume is equal to the slope, represented by a constant k. As this product is constant for a fixed temperature and quantity of a gas, we can write the following relationship, which allows us to determine a new pressure or volume after one of these variables has been changed. Another gas law is credited to French scientist Jacques Charles, who studied the effect of temperature on the volume of gases. As temperature increases, so does the volume. The relationship is direct, given that the temperature is in Kelvin. Charles plotted his data against Celsius temperatures, the results of which indicated a volume of zero would occur at minus 273 degrees Celsius where there would be a total lack of motion of particles. Lord Kelvin later suggested that this represented an absolute minimum of temperature. If volume is plotted against the temperature in Kelvins, the straight line passes through the origin. Similar to what was done for Boyle's law, we obtain a relation between an initial temperature and volume and a final temperature and volume, given the pressure and quantity of gas are constant. Another French scientist, Joseph Gay-Lussac, discovered that if a gas is contained in a vessel that cannot expand, then as the Kelvin temperature increases, the pressure increases proportionally. From this, another gas law follows. In each of these three laws, one of the variables of pressure, volume, or temperature was held constant. In reality, it is much more common that all three of these variables change. We can combine these gas laws into a single relationship known as the combined gas law. Note that the quantity of gas is still constant in all of these equations. Additionally, the temperature is always in Kelvin. The amount of substance is related to the other three variables in the ideal gas equation. If any three of these four parameters are known, the other can be deduced. Note that R is the ideal gas constant. Doing what we did with the constant K earlier, we come up with the following relation, from which any of the other gas laws can be derived. Let's look a bit closer at the ideal gas constant. First, recall Avogadro's hypothesis, which states that one mole of any gas occupies the same volume as long as the temperature and pressure are constant. Also, standard temperature and pressure, abbreviated as STP, refers to a temperature of 273 Kelvin, or 0 degrees Celsius, and a pressure of 101.3 kilopascals, or 1 atmosphere. You may come across SATP, which is standard ambient temperature and pressure. The pressure is still 1 atmosphere, but the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. At STP, 1 mole of gas occupies 22.4 liters. We can then determine the value of R by substituting 1 mole of gas at STP conditions into the ideal gas equation. Sometimes you'll come across R in units of joules per mole Kelvin. This makes sense since a kilopascal is equal to 1,000 pascals or 1,000 newtons per meter squared. 1,000 liters is equal to 1 meter cubed, and a joule is the same as 1 newton meter. R in terms of joules shows up briefly in enthalpy and is used much more often in AP chemistry too. We could also express R in terms of other pressure units. These are the values expressed in the formula sheet that accompanies the AP chemistry exam. Now we'll finally take a look at an actual example problem. A sealed rigid container contains 2 moles of a sample at 35.2 degrees Celsius and 23 psi. Rigid here just means that the container won't change shape so the volume will be constant. If we lower the temperature to minus 70 degrees Celsius, at what temperature did the pressure reach 16.2 psi? First of all, this minus 70 degrees Celsius temperature is essentially just a red herring. It won't be used in our calculation, though it does indicate that our answer should be between 35.2 degrees Celsius and minus 70 degrees Celsius. The volume in moles will not change here, so if we change the temperature, only the pressure should change. We're dealing with initial and final variables, so we can write down gay lussacs law, which relates temperature to pressure. Alternatively, we could write down either the combined gas law or this form of the ideal gas law, 
and notice the constant variables just cancel, leaving us with Gay-Lussac's law. Before we get too carried away, remember that the temperature should be in Kelvin. The Celsius temperature was good to the first decimal place, so the Kelvin temperature is too, since sig figs for temperature are based on precision. Now, since we have the initial pressure, final pressure, and the initial temperature, we can solve for the final temperature. However, we're still not done because we should give the final answer in degrees Celsius and not Kelvin. Negative 60 degrees Celsius is indeed within the temperature range we expected. Our temperature value in Kelvin was limited to two sig figs since one of the pressure values given was two sig figs. This meant it was good to the tens place and as a result the value in degrees Celsius must be as well. Next we are asked to determine the volume of the container. Since we're given a set of the pressure, moles, and temperature, it would make sense to use them with the ideal gas equation to determine the volume. We'll assume the ideal gas constant was not given to us in terms of PSI, so we could either convert the ideal gas constant into being in terms of PSI, or convert the pressure into a different unit, which is probably the simpler option. We then plug these four values into the equation and solve for volume. There is another equation we can derive from the ideal gas law which is quite useful and involves molar mass and density. Remember that molar mass is just mass over the number of moles, but using the ideal gas law we can express the number of moles in terms of pressure, volume, the ideal gas constant, and temperature. Doing a little rearranging we notice we have mass over volume which we can express as density. Here it's represented by lowercase d but you may also see it designated as the lowercase Greek letter rho. Depending on whether or not our gas particles are molecules or atoms, the equation would be molecular weight or molar mass. In this case, it's MW for molecular weight. This equation is nicknamed the kitty cat equation, which comes from meow, starts with M and ends with W, and the DRT, dirt, which is what kitty cats put on the P in their litter boxes. This is just a convenient way to remember the equation. Now we'll try this out in an example problem. We have a 3.26 gram sample of an unknown gas with a volume of 3 liters. We're asked what the molecular mass is. Well, we have all the values we need for our kitty cat equation. The density is simply the mass of the gas divided by the volume. The pressure is in kilopascals, so we can use a value of r in terms of kilopascals. We get a molecular weight of 27.9 grams per mole. If we assume the gas is diatomic, then it is most likely nitrogen, which has a molecular weight of 28.0 grams per mole. It's not exact, but it's the closest option. We could still do this problem without using the kitty cat equation though. As molecular weight is the mass divided by the number of moles, we could just determine the number of moles separately using the ideal gas law, and then divide the given mass by this. We see that we got the same molecular weight. Either method's fine here since the question didn't ask us to solve it a specific way. Based on everyday experience, we know that puddles of water eventually evaporate even though the temperature is well below water's boiling point. English chemist John Dalton found that even in a sealed container, some of the water evaporates. The term vapor is now used to describe the gaseous portion of a substance present above the liquid phase of the substance. The pressure exerted by a vapor of a substance is known as the vapor pressure. This is dependent first on the substance's chemical structure, and second on the temperature. At a given temperature, there's a maximum value the vapor pressure can reach. When the vapor pressure reaches atmospheric pressure, the liquid will begin to boil. The temperature at which this occurs is called the boiling point. But this doesn't quite answer the question of why we have vapor existing at temperatures below the boiling point. When we're below the boiling point, although the average kinetic energy of the liquid molecules is not sufficient for vaporization to take place, some of the molecules do have enough kinetic energy to escape from the surface of the liquid and enter the gas phase. The blue curve is for the sample of matter at a lower temperature and the red curve is when it's at a higher temperature. The area under the curve to the right of the minimum kinetic energy needed to escape represents the particles with enough energy to evaporate. At a higher temperature, we see that more particles have enough energy to evaporate. Also note here that if the amount of the substance does not change, the total area under the curve will always be the same. Here's a plot of the vapor pressure versus temperature for three different liquids diethyl ether, ethanol, and water. The boiling points can be read off as the temperatures at which the liquid's vapor pressures reach atmospheric pressure, in this case 760 torr. We can see that all of these substances are liquids at room temperature since their vapor pressure is below 760 torr. Evidently, if the atmospheric pressure is different, then the boiling point will be different. Here we can see the effect of altitude on atmospheric pressure, and consequently on the boiling point of water. As the altitude increases, the atmospheric pressure drops and the boiling point of water does as well. 
If we were to boil some food such as an egg, it would take longer since the water would be boiling at a lower temperature. Pressure cookers are based on the reverse of this. Because they're sealed, steam is trapped as the contents are heated, raising the pressure inside the vessel. This means the boiling point of water increases and the higher temperature generally shortens the cooking times. The reason different liquids have different boiling points is related to the attractive forces between the particles of different liquids. Intermolecular forces such as London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, and hydrogen bonds are the forces between molecules. Stronger intermolecular forces result in fewer molecules having enough energy to overcome the attraction and escape into the gas phase. Liquids with a high vapor pressure will evaporate easily and are said to be volatile. For illustration, here is a table comparing the vapor pressures and boiling points of different liquids at 25 degrees Celsius. Diethyl ether's bent shape gives it a slight polarity that produces dipole-dipole forces that hold its molecules together. Ethanol, like all alcohols, can hydrogen bond to its neighbors, but to a lesser extent than water can. The liquid metal, mercury, bonds to its neighboring atoms using the sea of electrons bonding model that holds its atoms tightly together, giving it a very small vapor pressure and a higher boiling point than the other liquids shown here. Dalton did a series of experiments in which he prepared various gases and collected them in a glass jar by displacing water from the jar using a pneumatic trough. He assumed that he would obtain a jar full of the gas he was preparing and nothing else, but he realized he was wrong and in fact the jar must also contain a certain amount of water vapor mixed with the gas. The results of these studies was Dalton's law of partial pressures, which states that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the component gases. For example, if we were to combine each of these three gases, they would continue exerting their own partial pressures producing a mixture of gases whose overall pressure is equal to the sum of the individual partial pressures. Let's utilize this concept in an example problem. Here we have a system consisting of three bulbs, where one contains nitrogen, one contains hydrogen, and the other is evacuated. The nitrogen and hydrogen are both at 60 psi. For now, we'll just focus on part A, where the stopcocks are opened, and we're asked to determine the new pressure of the overall system once it reaches equilibrium. We are told to assume no reaction occurs. From Dalton's law of partial pressures, we can just focus on the individual gases. For instance, looking at the nitrogen, we can find the partial pressure once the volume is increased using Boyle's law, or we can just derive this from the ideal gas law. We can assume temperature and moles are not changing here. We aren't given a value for the volume, so we can just call the volume of one bulb V. The initial volume of the nitrogen is V, and when the stopcocks are open, the volume is increased to 3V. The volumes and initial pressures of the hydrogen are the same, so the calculation is identical. To get the total pressure, we simply add the partial pressures of the two gases. Before we do part B of the question, there's another concept that would be helpful to cover, which can be derived using the ideal gas law. Whether we write the ideal gas law for a total mixture or an individual gas component, it will be the same format, so let's divide the ideal gas equation for all the gases by the equation for a single gas. The volume and temperature are the same, so they cancel, as does the ideal gas constant, and after a little rearranging we see that we have a simple expression for the partial pressure of a gas in terms of the total pressure and the mole fraction of the gas. Just as a quick example to illustrate this, let's say we have 32 grams of methane and 0.8 moles of nitrogen, with a total pressure of 1.7 atmospheres. What are their partial pressures? Well, we can use the equation we just derived, in which case we need the total pressure, moles, and total moles of the gases. Using the molar mass of methane allows us to determine the number of moles of methane, and then the total number of moles. We're given the total pressure, so we simply multiply the total pressure by the mole fraction of each gas to get their partial pressures. Now, turning back to our main example, we see that part B is a little more tricky than part A. In this case, the gases are reacting to form ammonia. Well, assuming the reaction goes essentially to completion, we are probably going to want to do some type of limiting excess calculation to determine how much ammonia we have and how much of the other gases are left. It's probably best to write out the reaction first, but what will we work in? Moles? We could probably do this, but we aren't given a value for V, so we would need to express everything algebraically and then hope that V cancels when determining our final pressures, which it should in this case. That seems like a lot of work, and this wouldn't be ideal if we were working under time constraints. But there's a more straightforward way. We just determined that for a mixture of gases, their partial pressures are proportional to their concentration. We saw that in the form of a mole fraction. This means we can use the gas partial pressures as we would use solution concentrations in a limiting excess problem. 
This also has the benefit of working in pressures, which our final answer needs to be in. Let's imagine we open the stopcocks and nothing happens. This is just like what we did in part A, where each gas ended up having a partial pressure of 20 psi. Now we know that moles and partial pressures are proportional to each other, so we can express the mole ratios from the reaction in terms of pressure, which makes the unit cancelling all work out nicely. It seems that the hydrogen is a limiting reagent since it will result in a lower partial pressure, and thus lower concentration, of ammonia. If we use up all the hydrogen, the partial pressure of the nitrogen used up would be 6.7 psi. We can summarize the partial pressure information in an ICE table, where I stands for initial, C stands for change, and E stands for equilibrium. For this reaction, we can say that the equilibrium lies far enough to the right that the reaction essentially goes to completion. Of course, we can simply fill in the initial partial pressures before the reaction takes place, and then the changes that occur based on the calculations we just did. Then the final partial pressures are straightforward to determine. The overall pressure is just the sum of these partial pressures. This seems like a reasonable result. We had 40 psi as the total pressure in part A, and the reaction results in converting 4 gas molecules to 2 gas molecules, so it's good that the overall pressure we obtained for B is smaller. The final example we'll do to illustrate Dalton's law of partial pressures has to do with a gas being collected above water. Here we have a 0.7 gram sample of zinc reacting with sulfuric acid, producing zinc sulfate and hydrogen gas. We're given the lab pressure and the temperature and need to determine the volume of dry hydrogen collected. Of course, based on what we had discussed with Dalton's experiment, we expect there would be some water vapor collected in the flask as well. We know the temperature and the moles of hydrogen can be determined from the amount of zinc that reacted, so as long as we can figure out the partial pressure of hydrogen, then we can use the ideal gas law to determine the volume. The system will be equilibrated to atmospheric pressure, so the total pressure of the hydrogen and water vapor is 102 kilopascals. At 24 degrees Celsius, the partial pressure of water vapor is 2.98 kilopascals. We'd either be given that value or have to find it in some table. We simply subtract this from the total pressure to obtain the partial pressure of the hydrogen. Using the balanced equation and the amount of initial zinc, which we are told reacts completely, we determine the moles of hydrogen gas produced. Also, let's not forget to convert the temperature into Kelvin. Then we can plug these values into the ideal gas equation to get the volume of hydrogen gas collected. It's likely your first introduction to chemistry in elementary school may have been a study of the kinetic molecular theory of matter. This theory states that matter is composed of particles, such as molecules, atoms, or ions, in continuous motion. In the solid state, the particles are close together and only vibrate. In a liquid, the particles are farther apart and move around. And in a gas, the particles are much farther apart and move around freely in a random fashion. When we use the kinetic molecular theory of matter, we make a number of assumptions which are included in the postulates of the kinetic molecular theory. The first is that the volume of gas particles can be assumed to be negligible relative to the space between them. Essentially, the individual gas particles are so small compared to the distance between them that at SATP, more than 99.99% of the volume of any gas is actually empty space. The second postulate is that gas particles are in constant motion. Gas particles colliding with the walls of their container produce pressure. Gas particles also neither attract nor repel one another. At room temperature, gas particles move at speeds in the order of 200 to 2000 meters per second, so they collide with one another very frequently. These assumptions basically state that no energy is lost during the collisions. In other words, the collisions are perfectly inelastic. If this were not the case, the particles would gradually lose their energy. In fact, particles actually do transfer kinetic energy, but the average kinetic energy of all the particles present in a sample remains constant. Finally, the average kinetic energy of a gas sample is directly proportional to the temperature of the gas in kelvins. Recall that kinetic energy is the energy resulting from movement, and for an object, its value depends on the object's mass and velocity. For any sample of matter, there is a normal distribution of energies. The average kinetic energy is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature. In other words, if we have a sample of hydrogen gas and a sample of oxygen gas at the same temperature, they will both have the same average kinetic energy. We can also express the average kinetic energy in another way. The term in brackets where m is the mass of a single gas particle and the mu squared with the bar over top of it is the average of the squares of the particle's velocities, the bar is just a way of saying average, is basically the average kinetic energy of a single particle. We multiply this by Avogadro's number to get the average kinetic energy per mole of gas particles. Our goal here is to determine an expression for the root mean square velocity of the gas particles.
Note that we have two expressions for the average kinetic energy and we can isolate that mu term. If it bugs you that we have Avogadro's number in the one expression, just recall that R is in units of joules per mole Kelvin, so in fact both average kinetic energy expressions were for one mole of gas. The root mean squared velocity is the average velocity of a gas particle, and we obtain this by taking the square root of the average of the squares of the velocities. The mass of a single gas particle multiplied by Avogadro's number is just the molar mass of the gas. However, this molar mass is in kilograms per mole, and this is why. If we do unit analysis, we know our term in the square root should be meters squared per second squared. R is in joules per mole Kelvin, and recall a joule is kilogram meters squared per second squared. This means the mole and Kelvin units will cancel as they should, but we need our molar mass in kilograms for it to cancel correctly. While these equations may be very helpful to justify or explain gas behavior, their use is no longer required on the AP Chemistry exam. The same can be said for the use of Graham's Law and the van der Waals equation, which we'll take a look at shortly. Just to check that we know how to apply these equations, let's do a quick example. Right away we should convert the temperature to Kelvin. With this temperature, it's pretty straightforward to determine the average kinetic energy. The molar mass of nitrogen is 28 grams per mole, and we divide by 1000 to get this in kilograms per mole. We mentioned earlier that around room temperature, we'd expect the velocity to be in the range of 200 to 2000 meters per second, so this value seems reasonable. If we forgot to convert the molar mass to kilograms, we would have gotten a value around 60 meters per second. The average distance a particle travels between collisions in a sample of gas is called the mean free path and is typically very small, in the range of 60 nanometers. The many collisions result in a wide range of velocities as particles collide and exchange kinetic energy. This is an illustration of the velocity distributions for various gases at STP conditions. Comparing the curves, we see that as the mass of a particle increases, its average velocity decreases, as we'd expect from the root mean square velocity equation. This figure compares the velocity distributions of a particular gas at different temperatures. Increasing the temperature of a gas sample increases the average kinetic energy and broadens the entire distribution of velocities, causing the average velocity of a particle to increase. Two important terms for describing gases are diffusion and effusion. We'll first take a look at diffusion, which describes the mixing of one gas through another. The rate of diffusion is the rate of the mixing, and can be calculated by directly relating the relative distance traveled by two types of molecules in the same period of time to their relative velocities. These ratios are both inversely related to the square root of the ratio of the molecule's masses. Effusion is the passage of a gas through a tiny orifice, into an evacuated chamber. The rate of effusion measures the speed at which the gas is transferred into the chamber. Scottish chemist Thomas Graham developed Graham's Law of Effusion, which states that the rate of effusion is inversely proportional to the square root of the mass of the particles. Essentially, this law means that the rate of effusion of a light gas is much faster than that of a more massive gas. The rates of effusion of two gases at the same temperature may be compared by an equation similar to the one we saw for diffusion. One popular experiment illustrating Graham's law involves the determination of the distances traveled by ammonia gas and hydrogen chloride gas from opposite ends of a glass tube. When the two gases meet, they form a visible white ring of ammonium chloride. But which end will this white ring actually be closer to? Well, the hydrogen chloride molecules are heavier than the ammonia molecules, so using Graham's law, we see that their root mean squared velocity will be smaller. Thus, the hydrogen chloride molecules will not travel as far as the ammonia molecules in a given amount of time, and the white ring of ammonium chloride will be closer to the right end of the tube, based on the illustration. Next, let's determine the ratio of the distances traveled by the two gases. Note that the use of Graham's Law is not tested on the AP Chemistry exam. Recall that the ratio of the distances traveled will be inversely proportional to the square root of the ratio of the masses. The same can be said for the ratio of the root mean square velocities. Here we're given the average velocity of an ammonia molecule and are asked to calculate the average velocity of a hydrogen chloride molecule. Rearranging this equation and plugging in the values, we can solve for the average velocity of a hydrogen chloride molecule. We've talked a bit about ideal gases already. Ideal behavior is most present at low pressures and high temperatures. This is because real gases do have some volume while ideal gases are assumed to have no volume. Additionally, they exert some attractive forces on their neighboring particles, while ideal gases are assumed to be completely independent of the gas particles that surround them. In 1873, Johannes van der Waals modified the ideal gas law to fit the behavior of real gases. This involved two small correction factors, 
The first one, which includes an A factor, accounts for the intermolecular forces existing between the gas particles. Adding this to the actual pressure yields the pressure of the gas if it were ideal. The second one includes a B factor and corrects for the volume of the gas particles themselves. Subtracting this from the actual volume yields the ideal gas volume. Recall that calculations involving the van der Waals equation are not tested on the AP chemistry exam. Every gas has its own unique values for A and B. Note that the units of A and B allow proper cancellation to produce units of pressure and volume respectively when substituted into the equation. We can see some patterns here. For instance, moving down the noble gas family, the value of A increases since the attractive forces between the particles are increasing. The dominant intermolecular forces for the noble gases are London dispersion forces, which increase with the size and polarizability of the electron cloud. B also generally increases since the volume of atoms increases. The one exception is neon. This is likely because the van der Waals constants are derived from experiment, and as a result they reflect many real-world variables. So the B constants are not necessarily only determined by the size of the molecules or atoms. When looking at a graph of PV over NT versus P for real gases, the effect of IMFs and gas volume on real gas behavior is easy to see. Increasing pressure results in a deviation from ideal gas behavior becoming more pronounced. It is more noticeable for larger gases which have greater volume and exert larger London dispersion forces. We can go further and examine just one mole of a particular gas but at different temperatures. We are plotting PV over RT on the y-axis this time. Since we're plotting this for one mole of gas, we're looking at the deviation from one. At higher temperatures, there is less deviation. This plot provides good support for what we've been saying about gases behaving most ideally when the pressure is low and the temperature is high. These two things, low pressure and high temperature, make real gas volume and real gas attractive forces less noticeable.